interview with Noel Eastwood. Noel is a astrologer, psychologist, and author. And today we are just going to be asking some questions. And um, long story short, I met Noel about over a week ago. I just finished his book, Psychological, Psychological Astrology, an Introduction. And I listened to this book on Audible and just enjoyed it so much. And I figured, okay, I need to learn more about this author and this astrologer. So did a quick Google search and I found Noel's YouTube channel, which is called Pluto's Cave and um, commented and said, you know, love your work. I'm so happy to see that you have a YouTube channel and I can't wait to learn more from you. And after a little bit of talking, we talked about an interview and here we are. So I'd like to welcome Noel. Hey Taylor, what a pleasure to be here and to talk with you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited. I have, I just want to ask you a billion questions already. <laughs> um, so we, this is the first time that we have met face to face. We've spoken yeah. on email for about one week and um, yeah, so I guess we just jump right in and just start with some questions. So um, I also wanted to mention the um, a few of the other books that you have written that I can't wait to also read. Um, there's Psychological Astrology and the Twelve Houses, Astrology of Health, and The Fool's Journey Through the Tarot are just a few more of his books. So the first question I wanted to ask was, what are the unique benefits of utilizing charts in your practice? Oh my goodness. Okay. So when, so when, when you get a client with, and this could be for uh, any therapist, any, any health healer, any allied health person as well, but the hardest thing to do is to do uh, a, an analysis of where they're at. So that could be a symptom, on a, symptom analysis or a mental health analysis rather than spending six weeks asking questions and trying to drag the information out of out of people because a lot of them don't understand what their problem is they don't know really why they're there some people do but most people don't so uh, getting their chart and looking at that it's going to point you almost immediately to the key conflicts in their life so when we find conflict in the chart that's where the person spends most of their time stressing over and worrying over. It's like, you know, if you have a, um, a splinter in your foot, it worries you all day until you get home and, and pull it out. So it's the same with psychological uh, problems. The, the conflicts in the chart will reflect some sort of psychological issue that they have. And often because it's in the natal chart, then, you're, then they're looking at, um, you know, things from the past, which is, sort of a lot of fourth house stuff there and the fourth house we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute but the fourth house represents your background your mm -hmm. childhood your upbringing but also the the values the attitudes the belief systems that you would adopt from your caregivers could be your parents brother or sister uncles aunts could be close friends and then from school so society's impact on us as well as our our close family is seen in the chart and often that fourth house will reflect a lot of that awesome yeah so the chart you're saying it is kind of like a good um guide map to guide map <laughs> a good guide <laughs> map that you can use to pierce the psyche in that way and to kind of get to the root of the problem and begin the healing um with more focus on different areas of life um, yeah. I also yeah. wanted to ask, um, how long did you practice? You're retired now um, from your psychology practice, correct? Yep. Yeah. And how so that long? was about five, about five years ago. I think the end of 2017. Okay. And from what so, I read it, you have about 40 years experience with psychology and astrology. Yeah. So I, things really started back in probably 1980 when I started doing Tai Chi and uh, started teaching, but what happened with the Tai Chi is that I started having weird experiences I'd out of body and it just sort of went from there. So what happened is that um, I started teaching Tai Chi, started taking private clients for Tai Chi and meditation. And uh, then I realized that I'm doing stuff with people's psyche. 
that I really need to know more. So I went and studied clinical hypnotherapy, had a clinical hypnotherapy practice, which is basically the self-hypnosis book that I've written is a lot of the stuff that I, I learned way back then working with people. I was lucky that I had a, a Jungian psychotherapist as a mentor for my practice. And then I was teaching through all this time. So, you know, don't give up your day job, keep your day job. And I was doing all of my other things at night, the teaching, the Tai Chi, the, you know, bit of the healing um, and the clinical hypnotherapy. But then I finished teaching and I went back to university and uh, studied psychology to become a psychologist. So it's, it's been a little bit of an up and down journey, but it's all sort of one has built upon the other. Yeah. Throughout all that time, because I was mixing with people all day, people with problems, children with problems, parents with problems, that um, I would ask people for their birth data. Mm -hmm. And I've not ever, in, all, in the past 40 odd years or so, ever had someone say no. Everyone's like, oh, you do astrology, oh, that's cool, you know, da 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 da. So I, that's a massive database that I have wow. of people with. Uh, learning difficulties because my first goal was I got, got all these kids because I was working as like a school psychologist by this time. I have all these children in different schools that I was working at that had, you know, ADD, ADHD, behavioural disturbed, um, domestic violence, uh, learning difficulties, autism. And I was, you know, part of my role was to test. We've got to test these kids, try and get funding for special services for them. So I would ask their parents for the birth data. So the, the part of the research that I did was to look at the groupings of kids with learning difficulties and, and then look at their charts. Look at kids with ADD, which is the inattentive, daydreaming type of kid, and look at their charts and look for the commonalities. ADHD, which is the hyperactive, impulsive, uh, the behaviorally disturbed, the, the naughty kids, a lot of them, and look at comparing charts and looking at patterns, things started to click for me. That's really, I think, when I really, really knew that I was doing astrology. Up until that time, I was, it was hard work. Doing a reading would take six hours of preparation. I'd type it all up and whoo wee But when I started to see these patterns forming, and then when I had my own clinical practice, but particularly the clinical hypnotherapy, because the people that came for hypnotherapy, completely different to what I would have coming for psychology. Different sort of people. The hypnotherapy people were far more open and interested in esoteric sort of stuff. So gathering their data and then looking at their psychological issues and disabilities was another set of research that I did. So all of that research came together and that's when I wrote the first book on hypnotherapy. Uh, self-hypnosis and back in 96 i think it was that's called a uh, tame and, your inner dragon oh uh, yeah yeah so then the tame your inner dragon was the second version of the first book that i mm -hmm. wrote in 96 mm -hmm. i just wasn't i'd done too much you know 20 years later or what whatever it was um so much more had happened and i knew a lot more of what i was talking about so i oh. rewrote the book basically and yeah. added more stories that's beautiful. All of that is so beautiful. So you have really spoken to many different children, people who are very open about esoteric things, and then people who may want to go the more traditional medical route, but they seemed also to be open. You said you never really had anybody say, oh, no, okay. Never. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so cool. Yeah, that, that was the, the important part was being brave enough to ask people. And when I right. realized that people, people were interested in this sort of stuff. So yeah, it got easier. I found the same for me because I would always want to know their information. And for a long time, I wouldn't ask. And I finally have gotten to the point where, yeah, I just, I'm really interested and I don't find it um, as, as scary anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah. yeah there's a lot of unique benefits then to using the charts because you were able to yeah help a multitude of people um oh. thank you for sharing all of that um my next question was what aspects in someone's chart would prompt like extra benefit from psychological support so in one of in the book that i read this psychological astrology you mentioned sensitive people 
and how they seemed to be the kind to come find help or, or need the most support. So yeah, there, there, there's, yeah, now we're starting to get into the nitty gritty. So the most, in, the most impactful patterns in the chart, so we, we would call these significators, which is like uh, Sun conjunct Pluto. You have that conjunction, you know that that person's going to exhibit an enormous amount of plutonic traits. No matter where the sun is in the chart, whatever sign it is, if there's conjunction or an opposition from Pluto or any of the outer planets, then there's conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, that conflict could have already been tamed and adapted and, and managed early in life. So it might not manifest the way we look in you know, astrologers or me looks at people with, with a, a, a plutonic pattern in their chart and it's like, okay, here's our first conflict. Mm -hmm. So what I found in all the research that I've done and the work that I've done is that the two luminaries, the sun and the moon, they're the, they're the most sensitive points in the chart. Not all the time because your ascendant could be conjunct Jupiter or you know, there could be other things happening in the chart which are just as sensitive. But anything that is happening to the sun and the moon in the natal chart, be it a, an opposition or a conjunction, squares and trines, they don't play the role that an opposition or a conjunction does. You know, a conjunction is 100%, an opposition is 95%, but then a square and a trine, probably 50%. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the other minors, the sextiles, quintiles, that sort of stuff. Okay. So we're looking initially sun and moon and what's happening with them. And then we would look at the personal planets. So Mercury, Venus and Mars. And we want to see what's happening with them, particularly if there's conjunctions or oppositions to um, generational, you know, the outer planets. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, of course, is the, the sensitivity of the ascendant. The ascendant is almost like the most sensitive point of the chart because the way I look at it, the first house in the ascendant is like a microcosm of the whole chart. They, this is you, is that ascendant in your first house. So when my eyes look at a chart, boom, straight to the first house and to the ascendant. Because they're the ones, it's the first house, it's an Aries house. What do Aries do? They run along and headbutt everybody. You know, they race to the front of the line, you know, to the water fountain and knock the kids away and get to the water first, you know. They need this massive expression. So if you're in an Aries ascendant, then you know exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> if you've got a fire planet in that first house, then you are going to exhibit Leonic and Aries and Jupiter traits. You're going to exhibit those air traits. No matter what ascendant it is, it could be in, in water or in earth or air, but they're adding a fire planet. And it's the same with adding an earth planet or an air planet or a water planet to that first house it's going to take on those flavors and you, you know like you yourself a lot of people want to learn astrology but it takes time mm -hmm. it takes a lot of work mm -hmm. if you when i was doing astrology early up probably for the first three or four years before i started to click that these patterns were forming um i would have to go sun opposite Jupiter and then delineate that and it was like all of these steps would go down as I'm delineating every single point but to synthesize it into one story rather than 30 or 40 stories that's what slowly came from all the research that, that I've done and all the readings that I do so it's not that I can just do it like that mm -hmm. sometimes a chart is really easy to, to read which reflects a person they, you know, when, when you meet them, they're quite open and friendly. And, you know, oh, that's why the child was so easy to read because it, they're very open to it. Then there's closed people that, you know, don't say anything and the, their chart will reflect that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so it, it's astrology is not easy. It takes massive structure, organisation and dedication and discipline to learn it properly. So... Yeah, to all those budding astrologers, work hard. Definitely. Yeah, and I like that you started with the, the luminary, the sun, the moon, and then, of course, the ascendant, the rising. Those are 
what people call the big three. So I think that's a great place to start um, for anybody, but especially when you are looking for sensitive points. And um, what do you think about the houses if people have a lot of planets or a lot going on in like the fourth, the eighth, and the twelfth? Would that be something? That Absolutely. Think? Yep. So when I when I when I look at a chart, if I see a grouping of three or more planets in one house, so a mini stellium, a stellium is four planets, but a mini stellium of three planets in one in one house that's drawing my eye because here we have a melding or a blending of energies that needs to be teased out thread by thread by thread to understand how they're operating in that person's life so the first book that i wrote on astrology was the 12 houses because i use the houses it's like um it's like a uh the houses to me are like the swiss army knife it does so many things. I learned so much from reading people's houses, almost more than, than looking at signs and planets. The houses are the where. It's where we're expressing it, which means it's visible. You know, you say, where do you live? Oh, I know that place. Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a the, um, place where the dogs run around there and you've got a beach and I've been to that, you know, the bar there, et cetera, et cetera. You, you can relate to a house. Signs, that makes me think more. Planets, yeah, piece of cake. They're, yeah. the, <laughs> they're the most important. And yeah, I was watching one of your videos and I was like, wow, this girl's got it together because you're explaining the planets are the what, the signs are the how, and the house is the where. That is key to doing a reading. If you don't understand that, why well, are you going to struggle? So yeah, very impressed. Thank you. Well, in um, simplifying that, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do is simplify astrology to a point where obviously it's um, my website is called the everlasting spiral because it is just never ending and you can always go deeper and you can always find something new. But when we start at the very basics, it's just so helpful alone to learn the very basics of your chart to know your sun, moon and rising, I think is just so beneficial for mm -hmm. anyone mm -hmm. and um i would really like to simplify i i hate the word i don't hate but i don't like the word simplify i want to help people use their own critical thinking so i want them to be able to do that okay so where is it oh it's in the house of the home what what's going on mars oh mars is known for conflict or disruption or taking action and then what sign is it in how is this expressing itself and I think um, I would love people to have more confidence in um, in their own ability to interpret these things because they are everyone is able to make an interpretation whether they've been studying for a few weeks or many years I think if we just um, were to simplify it more it would be so much more helpful to the public and, mm. and um, not yeah. not keeping all of this information and um, you know I just um, I would love for it to for everyone to see how useful it is and that they are able to understand it just by making their own interpretations with just the little bits of information that we can um, help explain and provide for them <laughs> yeah well that that's the reason I wrote my books is that you know I'm doing something a little bit different to other people because I have access to all of these people with, you know, definite diagnoses of different disorders and being able to then gather that data and then look, look for the themes that flow through the common themes. That's so different to, you know, when I started, we, we had the Alan Oaken and uh, Robert Hand's books and you know, all the Eberton's books, which would give you the, the recipes, you know, like a, a, a recipe book, but it, astrology needs more than that. And I'm a big fan of Liz Green. I saw her presentation before I started learning astrology. She came to Sydney back in, that would be 85, I think it was. And, uh, of course, I didn't understand a word she was saying. I didn't know much about astrology back in those days. But, you know, thinking back, that was probably the turning point because it was the, that night was the night I made the decision. That's it. I'm, I'm studying astrology. Wow. Yeah. Yes. I love Liz Green. Um, I've read a couple of her mm. books 
um, I think like uh, astrology for lovers, which I feel like the title does not do that book justice. It, um, <laughs> yeah, it I know it's a dumb, dumn title because yeah, it's such a <laughs> juicy book. It is. It was so good. And I, I'm halfway through Saturn. I had to, I had to take a break <laughs> from Saturn <Yeah. laughs> because that one got a little intense for me. Um, but yeah, I love the way she simplifies things as well and makes it mm. um, just so, and that's how I felt about your books. When I was listening to the Audible, I felt like I was talking to a friend and like you were just explaining things to me in such simple terms. And I've been studying for a little over two years now. And I would say that I definitely do have a better handle on it than I did say a year ago so that definitely helped when it came to listening to your book but I think almost anybody um, would also benefit from even starting there because the way you explain things yeah you put it in such a way it's so easy to understand oh thank you yeah yeah I tried to make I wanted to write an introductory book but I didn't want it to be like a recipe book I wanted to make it interesting so that there would be chapters uh, that, that introduced new material that people wouldn't normally consider as introductory, like, um, you know, uh, Harold Shipman, yeah. uh, the, the, mur the, the, the doctor that killed his patients. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was so interested in looking at psychopaths because a lot of my psychology clients worked in uh, a work environment where there were psychopathic type managers that bullied them. You know, we, we look at psychopaths uh, like Case, Gacy and Bundy and that sort of stuff. Well, they kill people in horrible ways, but we have psychopaths with exactly the same traits, lack of empathy, narcissistic bullies in the workplace that they don't quite kill you, but they make your life a living hell. So I was seeing a lot of them, so I wanted to know. So that's why I got onto that one and put that in as a chapter to, to yeah. show those sort of things. That example was definitely, that was amazing to listen to. And um, I did, I loved how you would say, okay, now this aspect does give this feeling, but it does not prove exactly. But then you went to build upon that, which I loved because yeah, you built upon your own data and your interpretation mm -hmm. and it all made so much sense. And yeah, having that example, is always super interesting. Um, that kind of brings me to my next question, which what, what are some common transits that would like spur someone to seek counseling or turn inward or look for answers? Well, that's actually, that's really important because I've looked at that many, 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 many times over the past 30 odd years that um, people don't come for counseling or for an astrology reading for that matter, unless there's something happening in their life. And when you look at their chart, the most common things are an outer planet like Saturn, Chiron, and Pluto. Sometimes Neptune, not often Jupiter or Uranus, but Saturn, Chiron, and Pluto are the big ones. And that could be probably more common is a conjunction with the ascendant. So they're crossing the ascendant coming from the 12th house into the first house and wherever the ascendant is in the first house. That's a big, massive hit, which is I've got Pluto sitting on my ascendant exact now, and it has changed my life. Mind you, I've watched it for 20 years, terrified of the day when Pluto will come rolling over me like a steamroller because I've seen so many people. That, the Pluto transit to the ascendant, to the moon or to the sun, they're the biggies. People get cancer. People have a close family member die or they have a, a terminal illness. Like Pluto is the great annihilator of astrology. Yeah. Chiron too. Chiron will deliver some really nasty health effects and knock the bejesus out of you as he did to be in transit. Saturn's not as bad, but Saturn is depressing. It's like someone sucked all the juice out of you and you're just flat, no energy. And Saturn is also a lump of concrete. Like it's really hard to move a lump of concrete. So your life is just standing still. Nothing's happening. 
And like for you and I, we're, we're Leos. We're like, oh, this is terrifying. Nothing's happening. There's no adventure. There's no excitement. All of those dreams and goals I've got for you know next week, next month, I'm not fulfilling all the little things that I wanted to do. So those, those three outer planets are the biggies. Yeah. North node will sometimes chime in because uh, a north node, the north node for me is like a compass. The, the compass changes as the wind changes. So if you're in a sailing boat and the wind switches from you know, northeast to northwest, then you've got to, you've got to change your sail settings and pull ropes and change the rudder. That's what the compass does. That's what the north node does. It adapts to where it is in the chart. So it could be in your sixth house conjuncting Mercury or whatever, then you know that that person is going through a change of values, beliefs, and attitudes, and things are happening in their life that they're probably not even conscious of. And they won't be conscious for six to 12 months. And then they'll look back to that time and go, oh my God, that was such an important period of my life. So that will sometimes happen at the same time that Pluto, Chiron, or Saturn, um, you know, knocking the daylights out of that person. It's yeah. interesting that sometimes we'll get patterns happening all at the same time because when Saturn is, is making you feel tired and run down and, and quite unwell and nothing's happening in your life and you're so depressed and miserable, that's also forcing you to stop, listen, and I come back to basics, go to your foundations, Maybe I'm running around too fast. Maybe I'm ex my expectations are just ridiculous. I need to reassess and reevaluate. So the key words for Saturn, you know, I call him the wet blanket. That's a good one. He likes things concrete. Is the handbrake on your car? Um, but he also he wants consolidation and structure. So wherever he is in the chart, he will set about slowing things down in the where in the house of whatever house he's in, slow things down, forcing you to look at that area of your life. He's not so bad, whereas Pluto and Kiron will come in there and just kick things over and trash it and then walk out after five or whatever, 20 years of making your life hell. Yeah. So, so what sends people to, for counselling is it's not their mum or dad or their partner. It's usually uh, a transit of an outer planet to the ascendant, Sometimes it could be another point, usually a sensitive point, like a personal planet, Mercury, Venus, or Mars. Um, but particularly to the ascendant, sun, and moon, they're the big ones. Okay. Yeah, I thought yeah. Uh, for Saturn, a really good word for me, the, when I experienced my Saturn return and I found out I was having my Saturn return like halfway through, and I was like, oh, that explains a lot. Um, the word sobering, it's a very sobering <laughs> time. Like I felt like I hit a wall. And um, I, I love stoicism and all those quotes and, you know, mm. rising kind of kind of stuff. And uh, the obstacle is the way like things like that got me through because I was I didn't understand fully at the time why I was experiencing those delays and restrictions and why. Yeah, it was just a very sobering time. And I felt like I really did have to get back to basics and. Like you said, as a Leo, like I want to have fun and I want to keep going, <laughs> go on adventure. So, but it was, I felt um, a great responsibility for that period of my life. And um, so yeah. in, in Saturn transits for people that don't um, know, it's about every seven years. So we go from the age of seven is our first square. And um, that's kind of like almost like a blind spot, sort of like squares. Is that how you would explain a square? Yeah, square is, is there. You know, we're not looking there. It, it comes up. Uh, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm still learning about squares and, and trines because the energies of those are so subtle. Mm -hmm. They are very, very much, you know, we're very much blind to them. But right. we still move. It's, it's, it's like a puppet master with the strings that you can't see. You're mm -hmm. still manifesting that square. Mm -hmm. Like I have Jupiter Saturn square mm -hmm. and don't really notice it all that much. But if I take time to reflect 
on their placement in my natal chart where they actually are. And the fact that they're not in a comfortable aspect. And yet here we have the accelerator, which is Jupiter, the great adventurer, the biggest planet in our solar system in square aspect to Saturn, his father, uh, who is the great lump of rock that you can't get out of your front lawn. You have to go and pay someone you know, $10,000 to remove it. It's such an eyesore, but it's just stuck there. Um, but looking at those two energy forms, aha. Uh -huh. And then what I did with this one was I went into meditation uh, to go into the chart and talk to the two archetypes and aha, uh -huh. yeah. now I've got it. Yeah, that was a magic time for me. That's what I was going to say is um, knowing the square through our charts is so helpful because then you're able to honor those completely different energies. And then they're not so much in conflict. And it is something that you just have to be aware. Of. Well, in transit, thankfully, they, they move on. But um, mm. so I was just going to mention the ages because I found that Saturn transits, it's um, again, it's really sobering. So even if you're not into astrology, but you hear about Saturn return, um, I think a lot of people, when they hear the simple description of it, they're like, oh, okay, I might be experiencing that because it is so, it's almost obvious when you're going through it because it is such a sobering, um, depressing, <laughs> but <laughs> helpful yes. time so we can mature. Um, so it's 7, 14, 21, 29, 36, 43, 51, and 59. And it obviously those can range, go off like a, a year or two, um, depending on the transit of Saturn. But just wanted to throw that out there because mm. um, that's that was one of the times <laughs> that I felt the response, uh, the need to take on responsibility for myself and, and my psyche and to really address the things that needed that needed to be addressed at the time. Um, and then, yeah, Pluto, Pluto transits, like you said, it just comes in and there's no controlling Pluto and he's going to bring up the depths of everything. And it's just something that you have to just ride. And Kieran, um, I, I call it Chiron, but I like Kieran. That sounds <laughs> Kieran. Cool. I say Chiron. Yeah, Kieran. Um, Still learning a lot and that was actually one of the videos that I asked you to make so if, if anybody watching wants to go learn more about Chiron Noel has a video explaining um, that asteroid a little bit more it's the wounded healer so when we have transits to the wounded healer um, it's going to bring about our wounds and we're going to need to look at them and tend to those in order to continue our healing journey. So that would be yeah, a great time to look for psychological support, especially when it's mm. something so um, tender. Um, looking for support of any yeah, astrologers or psychologists. And I also um, meant to mention that in the beginning was anybody who does need psychological support, it's always good to seek out professional help, right? Exactly. Yes, yes. A lot, a lot of people will prefer to go to an alternative healer when I was working as a clinical hypnotherapist with my own practice, um, that was a fun time because I saw people in crises, but it, th those people were quite different to what would walk in my door in, in a psychology practice. Okay. Uh, it, it, was, it was a much better time. In psychology, you're restricted by uh, rules and regulations and... Um, you know, you can't do astrology, you can't do tarot reading, whereas as a clinical hypnotherapist or an alternative healer, you can do all sorts of weird things. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> doing past life therapy with people and you know, doing readings, taking them on journeys, uh, you know, working with the archetypes. It was good fun. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many different ways to find more out about ourselves. So why stick to just one? But ah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm all for trying all of them and seeing Absolutely. what's best for you and yep. even mixing all of them and um, not being afraid, I think is the whole, I love your um, YouTube channel named Pluto's Cave because it's like, go do it, go look, <laughs> go look at what needs to be looked at so you can grow and transform and it's so exciting to me because I feel like uh, in my life, I've definitely had to face things that I didn't want to face, but it's, uh, it's a part of me knew that if I, if I didn't, um, then nothing would change. So exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
So we talked about the transits. Um, what might it look like in somebody's chart if they're extra sensitive? Um, let's see. Uh, one of my questions is, what are some aspects in a person's chart that signifies how willing or unwilling they are to look within or? Uh, this is this is a good, that's a really good question. Um, the people that came to me for counselling, if so, some people would come to counselling because their wife or husband sent them mm -hmm. or their mother or father sent them. So they're not there willingly. And if you look at their chart, it's like, you know, there's, you know, there's not much chance that they'll be here for very long. Um, but those people that wanted that want the one therapy that need therapy, uh, there'll be indicators, significators in the charts to show that. So um, you know the the ones that don't hang around, that lack insight or don't want insight. Hate to say this, Sagittarians, but Sagittarius people, people with a strong Jupiter or a strong ninth house, they tend to know everything. Oh. Uh, like, oh, you know, I know how, you know, I don't need your advice because I know everything anyway. They're the hardest ones, but they're happy to have a conversation and they will tell you. <laughs> they won't have a conversation with you. They're the ones that will be talking at you. So of, of all, they're the hardest. Like Gemini, not a problem. Geminis are great. They, they, their mind is different to mine. I, I have so little air in my chart that when I see a Gemini, it's like, oh, this is like a different creature, like an alien, someone that has a brain that works different to mine. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're fine. The other signs are fine. Maybe strong Libra. And when I say strong, it's like a dominance in Libra. So the, the sun could be in Aries. The moon could be somewhere else. But if there's a dominance of more than three things happening in, in Libra, then it's like that starts to dominate the chart. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I have a dominance, like I got Jupiter, Venus, Mars, Sun and Pluto conjunct in Leo in the eighth house. So I'm dominant in Leo, but I'm also dominant in the eighth house. So that means that when I have to tease out all of these energies, I'm, I'm going to see that my foundations are basically Leo and Scorpio. I just can't help it. You know, I'm a sensitive person. Just ask my wife. <laughs> um, you know, easily hurt, but then you know, Leos are easily hurt too. The, the hardest thing for a Leo to copy is criticism. Oh, I give so much. Leos represent the sun. They shine for everybody. And they're really happy when other people smile back and re you know, enjoy what we're doing for them. And when someone doesn't enjoy it or puts us down or criticizes us, you know, we crawl off to our hole and we hide there until we until we heal our heart and come back again. It's like we wear the heart, our hearts on our sleeves. We're very vulnerable. We open up a heart to people we probably shouldn't sometimes. And yeah, we're, we're easily hurt. Absolutely. Let's see. Do you think clients find it more soothing or comforting to explore their charts alongside a professional rather than on their own? Um, Depends on the person, huh? I, I think that, yeah, that's a hard one. Like, you know, you and I, when we were little, we went to the library and got all the books on, on mm -hmm. ghosts and reincarnation and astrology, which is what I did, I think. It was probably 16, 17, 18, I'd go to the local uh, town libraries and get out all those books. And, you know, I, I would create charts and, and numerology patterns and that sort of stuff. And I didn't know what I was doing, but the hunger was there. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so, you know, the, the interest comes from way back. Did I answer your question? Well, I was asking, who do you, um, when it's, do you think it's more comforting to learn alongside someone? I know I, um, when oh, I like in a class, in a class or with, uh, with an astrologer or with a psychologist who does astrology, do you think, um, that that would be something that we should as a community maybe support more is like oh, doing absolutely. Yes, other yes. rather than being, yeah. doing our own. Yeah, if you're trying, trying to learn it yourself, 
there's so many pitfalls and you know, and, you know the internet is absolutely magic but there's so many people that post absolute rubbish on there particularly about the new age and esoteric stuff it's you know it is just way too much so you you need a mentor really you need someone that's experienced and knows what they're doing to say well you know that might happen in this particular way but you know let's look at all the other ways mm -hmm. uh, i think yeah mentorship learning in a class with a you know with a qualified teacher that sort of thing is if you want to be a professional which i think a lot of people do when they start studying astrology then you really need to find the best teacher for you find someone that empowers you that you can learn you can contact them at any time and get some feedback I, that's a good, yeah and i think yeah. also not being afraid to learn from different mentors as well and not just mm. stick with the one because i i've seen that a lot too and it is so it's i love the internet i mean that's how we met like we wouldn't have met without using yeah. the internet um, but like you said, there's so much information and it can be so overwhelming when you're Googling your placements and mm. some can be so depressing <laughs> and it doesn't even reflect that way in your chart. So yeah, definitely seek out different mentors and classes and find what fits for you and see what resonates with you. Again, like I just want people to trust themselves because it's already in there. You know, mm. the interpretations mm, yeah. I feel are in there too. I think, um, a lot of, I understand that, and I also support using our abilities um, to interpret the charts, like with our intuition, but I feel like if we don't give people the very basic information that's needed, like how are they going to use their intuition if they don't know what something means? And yeah. Um, yeah. I'm all about using your intuition, but I feel like if we were to provide um, clearer descriptions like the archetypes which I would love to do another talk with you just specifically about the archetypes because I feel like um, if and when I do teach my own course or mentor somebody I would actually start with the archetypes and I don't know if that's the Leo Ooh, or the Aries in me excellent. I just I feel like if people understood the archetypes then you would understand why Mars rules Aries you know, I think it's exactly like right. characters and uh, it's like the the players in the play like if you understand who they are and how they act then you'll the rest of it kind of comes together so I don't know I kind of went off on a thing yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just add too that you know I do a lot of mentoring with um with with professionals as well as people that uh have other mentors like it could be a shaman shamanic mentor um, a tarot mentor and astrology mentors, uh, hypnotherapy or psychology mentors as well. Uh, that's great because I am not the word of God. And I am as flawed as everybody else. And um, so, you know, working with several different people, you're getting, you're getting a viewpoint from different places, from different experiences. So, you know, my experience is what I can deliver. That person's experience is a different so they're going to deliver from a, a different place and that's how we learn and helps us intuit and discriminate what is of value to me good point yeah, so i think that's great definitely um and then i was going to ask uh did you teach your clients their chart when you asked them like for their information would you would you like give them reference points as to why you were like recommending a certain remedy or would you just go ahead and just use their chart to? So, so when I'm working with someone and, I, and I've got their chart there, then it would be a case of looking at the chart, walking through it and, and, and discussing what those key conflicts are and talking around it till we come up with, uh, with where they come from, you know, we go back into that fourth house of upbringing often, and then we can go and do some psychotherapy there. Okay. So it's yeah, combining combining your knowledge of the chart, passing that backwards and forwards between you and the client, and then developing a pathway forward with it. We could, you know, we could use archetypes, we could use hypnotherapy, 
you know, do a lot of that. We could use, um, you know, all sorts of different talk therapies. Yeah, there's, there's so many different pathways there. Yeah. Uh, inner child is what I do the most of the, what I used to do. Inner child. Inner child work. Mm. Well, and I was just going That's to ask how, how beneficial is it for parents to understand their children's chart? I think that could be a whole nother topic. So we can just kind of comment on that. And then maybe that could be our next um, talk would be yeah. exploring your child's chart. Well, as a parent myself, if I had have known now what I'm, if I had have known back then when I had kids what I know now, I'm sure things would have been a lot easier for all of us. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I've done a lot of readings for parents of newborns and parents with small children, and it's it's it, it's just opens up the view of who this this soul is and. I would thoroughly recommend it for anybody with children or prospective parents to make sure that they get someone to walk them through their child's chart because it's going to, it'll point out the pitfalls of their health and their psychological development. It's, it's all there in the chart. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, that is magic when you can do that and become a oh. magician. And I love that you point out the health and the psychological health. And then from my standpoint, I think uh, with my son in the fifth, I, I want the parents, or I don't want, I encourage parents to explore the child's birth chart because I want them to understand that they are an individual and that they're, they are their own expression and that it is going to be different. Maybe some similarities, but your child is not going to be a fitting image of you in every single way. And to honor them is just so, um, it takes, I feel like it takes your relationship with them to such another depth um, to accept who they are and, and also to guide them. Because if they do have these hidden troubles, you know, with the squares and stuff and they feel confused, um, then you're, you're able to guide them even, even better. Yeah. Yeah. Like just knowing that um, if, they, if your child has a lot of fire, then you can tell the parents that they got to drink a lot of water. You know, simple things like that, a lot of water, a lot of fruit, a lot of ice blocks, particularly in summer when it's hot. So just be mindful that when they go to bed, you check on their temperature when they've fallen asleep. And if they, they're roasting, you pull the doona off. So, you know, simple things like that, or, or a child that is a lot of air and a lot of fire, they're going to be inspired about everything. They're going to be interested in everything. So make sure you've got the books and you have the opportunities for them to learn, you know, get them a guitar or a keyboard or something, you know, um, karaoke so they can act out and, you know, re yeah. reproduce all the songs from Frozen. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's looking at the chart and then giving them ideas and that makes a difference. It's Absolutely. such a huge difference. It's so funny because with my, my son and I, we definitely have different energy levels and we'll get together. He's also Leo. Um, but, but <laughs> we do have so many differences and he would, I'm the one saying, go, go, go. And he would love to just hang at home. But so, um, I will, I'll get frustrated because I'm like, you know, keep up, let's go. we got things to do. But then I remember, okay, he, we're not exactly alike. And I need to honor the way he's expressing himself and his needs, which is he does, he needs more rest than me. And, um, but we, we bounce off each other really well. We're good <laughs> I'm trying my yeah, best. So, I'm trying my best. Yeah, no, that, that is brilliant. That's exactly what you need to do. <laughs> I like you using the word honoring, honoring the, um, the differences. It, it's also part when you're working with the archetypes or working with the planets, each planet wants, its, wants to give to you the very best of what it's got. So, for instance, um, Mars is the little boy energy. It's, it's a fun energy. It's a happy energy. But when it's, when it's caught in a, in a sign or a house or an aspect that makes it uncomfortable, then the happiness is not quite there. And so, you know, we have to respect that that Mars itself in its purest form is this raw, joyful, boyish energy that just makes you laugh and laugh and laugh because that's what they want to do. So how do, we, how do we work with the aspects that are not allowing Mars to express itself freely? How do we honour all of the things that's happening in the chart 
to bring out Mars. So if Mars is a planet that's most aspected or most conflicted in your chart, then all those things associated with it are going to be a little bit corrupted in your life. Your outer world will reflect what's happening in your inner world. So when we work with him in therapy, we would identify Mars as hey, he's a bit of an important player in your chart or in your life, in your psyche. But how do we how do we strip away some of the hardship that he's surrounded with, allowing him to express himself? So that how do we honor the archetypes? So how do we honor the differences? How do we honor the planets, the signs, that sort of stuff? It's, it's a pretty cool way of expressing it. I like that. Yeah. I think definitely um, when we do talk again, I feel like children, uh, the topic of children and just expressing yourself in these individual ways would be a really great topic because I can tell we're both getting like really excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can talk forever about that. I think we've already been talking for almost a solid hour at this point. Um, so yeah, let's see. Was there anything that you wanted to share that I haven't asked you? Um, Let me think. I probably I keep coming back to people that want to learn astrology, but but they want to learn to do it properly. Like you know, we want we want the the skills that we have to not sort of become fossils. We want them to keep expanding. We want to get better and better and better. And it's just a matter of doing a lot of charts. Every person that you walk past, you know, every family member, the dog and cat do charts of everything. Just do the charts. And after a while, the, the patterns that I talk about, you'll start to see them. I, I see it like a tapestry. And in a tapestry, there'll be certain themes that flow through the tapestry. But when you turn it backside up, all you see are the loose ends and there's no pattern at all. That's most people's life is like that. There's no pattern to their life and they're confused. But what we do with astrology is we turn it around and you can see, you know, the beautiful castle in the distance and the little deer and the, the farmer and that sort of stuff. The patterns come together and that's, that's what we do. But to be able to do that as a practitioner or as a professional requires a lot of dedicated practice. And just don't be afraid to ask questions of people you know, because that's how we learn. That was a beautiful description. I love that. <laughs> that's a very good point. I feel like I just came across that uh, realization myself over the past few months was, um, I feel like a lot of it lately, um, since it has come back, and I'm so glad that it is everywhere. I'm glad that it's all over the internet and social media. Some of, mm. um, you know, I think a lot, uh, some people can speak in absolutes, which can be dangerous because we don't know everything and like we are making interpretations um i think what i wish i would have done sooner was not be afraid to ask people questions um like more specific questions because they're already coming to you for the reading and you don't need to talk at them and actually john green um the astrologer john green in an interview he mentioned how his is uh, a lot of his time with his clients is listening um and just mm he's asking like these the proper questions and it almost it draws out whatever they need to um work through and yeah like you said don't be afraid to ask questions because then when you get those specific stories too that align with the pattern that you're looking at that's mm, like really one of mm. those aha moments like oh okay i get it now and that's yes. really helpful awesome well, maybe we'll stop here for today and um, yep. definitely meet up again when we can. Thank you so much. For oh, my pleasure. This is great. Me. I hope, uh, yeah, I can't wait to talk again. I think we have lots and lots to talk about. And um, yeah, we will talk again soon. Thank you, Taylor. This was so much fun.